Human beings are very much, they have what is called a cybernetic guidance mechanism, like a guided missile. A guided missile is fired at the target, and even if the target moves, the missile takes feedback and adjusts its course and hits the target. You have a cybernetic mechanism where you are learning. You are a learning machine. The more activities you engage in, the faster you learn. And pretty soon you become so smart that you can hit the target almost every time. I've worked with people, great stories, who are making one sale out of ten. That means that they were getting rejected nine out of ten times, but they kept on, kept on. When they learned proper sales techniques, they started to make two sales out of ten, three sales out of ten, four sales, five. One gentleman in my course came one year, came back the following year, he was making nine sales out of every ten calls. His income went up several hundred percent. He went from living in a small house to living in a large house. He'd been in sales for about 12 years before he learned how to sell professionally, and his sales exploded because you can't get worse at selling by doing it. You can increase the percentages, but the way you do it is you collect more no's. So your job now is to see how many no's you can collect each day. Just be polite, be friendly, be charming, as you already are, I'm sure, and just collect no's all the time. The more no's you get, the more successful you'll be. I taught this to a company recently, and they were using telemarketers. And they would start at about 8.30 in the morning, telemarketing, but the telemarketers would get burned out. Most telemarketing shifts are only three or four hours because telemarketers get burned out psychologically from all the rejection they get. So they put in a little contest. They had a gift certificate for lunch, and whoever got 10 no's first in the morning after they started would get a free lunch paid for by the company. But nobody could start until 8.30. So they'd wait at 8.30, they'd go ding, and everybody would start dying. And they would start dying and get as many no's as they can. And finally, one person would get 10 no's, usually took 20 or 30 minutes, and he'd ring a bell, ding, contest's over, he would win this prize. And then somebody else would come back and say, well, I would have won, but somebody wanted to buy. <laughs> and it took up all my time. And after that, they would laugh all day long, and they would start to work whole eight-hour shifts. All their incomes tripled, quadrupled, because the no motivated them. When they heard the word no, they would laugh. And it's one of the most important studies that I've seen. I want to pass this on to you because it's a guarantee to double your income or more. What they found is they studied people who, over the course of their careers, had moved up to the top and become the presidents of major businesses, the biggest businesses in the world. And they asked, why are these people so successful when they started off with many thousands of people? About one and a half percent of the population graduates from university and starts in the workforce each year. So at the beginning of the, each year, they line up like a marathon, and everybody's starting work for the first time, and then the race is on. And then over the years, some people get way ahead in the financial race, the majority stay in the middle, and a lot of people fall behind. So they went back and they studied the life career of these people to find out how these people got to the top. By the way, one of the most important things we do in life is study successful people and find out how they got there so we can follow their tracks. Well, here's what they found. In 25 years of research at the University of Florida, and they boiled it down to a single concept called deliberate practice, which means not accidental or occasional, but deliberate, focused practice of a skill. They found that these people had this one quality, just one, is what they would do is at each stage of their career, they would ask, what one skill will help me the most to move ahead now, at this stage of my career? If they were working for a large company, they would go to their boss, or they would ask their coworkers, or they would just think themselves. They would look at the top people and say, what are the top people really good at? And then they would pick one skill, like a sniper, they'd pick one skill, not a lot of skills, just one, the one that would help them the most. And they would write it down as a goal, and they would make a plan, and then they would work on developing that skill. 
and they would work every day on that skill until they had mastered the skill. How would they know when they had mastered the skill? People would start to say, you're very good at that. You are very good at negotiating. You are very good at uh, getting, new, getting appointments. You are very good at closing sales. People would start to compliment them on how good they were. And at that point, they said, say, okay, now I own this skill. Now, which one skill will help me the most? So I'm going to give you just a quick exercise. This exercise is life-changing if you take it. Ask yourself this question. If you could wave a magic wand, it's my magic wand, and overnight you could become absolutely excellent at any one skill in your business or your life, what one skill would help you the most to double your income? If you could become absolutely excellent overnight, what one skill would help you the most to double your income? Please write it down. What's the one skill? Write it down. So position yourself in your mind as a helper. You're there to help them, not to sell anything. That takes the pressure off of you, and it takes the pressure off of them. You're almost like a doctor of selling. Now, if you go to a doctor in Finland or anywhere in the world, doctors always follow a three-part process. If a doctor does not do this, it means that the doctor is not a good doctor. The first part of the process is what? When you go to a doctor, what's the first thing they do? They do an examination. You, wouldn't, you can imagine going to a doctor and you say, hello doctor, I've got stomach pains, and the doctor says, okay, let's do some surgery. <laughs> or, okay, here's a prescription. Take these pills. You say, well, you, you can't do that. You have to examine me first. You have to find out what my need or my problem is before you make a recommendation. What is the second thing that a doctor does? Second step in the process. It's a diagnosis. And the diagnosis is where you take what the patient has told you and the results of the test and you say, this is our problem. I remember I had a medical problem a few months ago and I went to two or three specialists and I went finally to another specialist and finally to another specialist and they sent me for a test and the test told me exactly what the problem was. It took about two months. But the first process is diagnosis. And once they had the diagnosis, very simple to deal with it, sort of. Anyway, the first part is the examination, the second part is the diagnosis, and then if the diagnosis is satisfactory and the patient agrees, then what is the third part? I see my coming here was an emergency. <laughs> the third part is the prescription, the course of treatment. In a sales conversation, the last thing that comes up is the prescription, the course of treatment, the recommendation to purchase the product or service. Selling out of sequence kills the sale. If a doctor said, get up here on the table and let's operate, you'd say, I'm getting out of here. You know, let me think it over. You know, think, I'll, I'll get back to you. I will get back to you at another time. He would flee if the doctor tried to give you a prescription or a course of treatment without doing an accurate examination and diagnosis. So from now on, see yourselves as doctors of selling. Stage number two in selling, in, and, and it's part of stage number one, is to establish rapport and trust, credibility. And you establish rapport and trust by focusing on the relationship rather than on the sale. The very best salespeople are the ones who form the very best relationships with their customers. They make it clear to their customers that they like them and they care about them, and they ask them questions. At the Harvard Business School, they came to this conclusion a few years ago that in the 21st century, all selling would be relationship selling. All success in business will be based on relationships. Your very best customers, I can tell you, are the people that you like and the ones who like you. 85% of your recommendations and referrals will come from people who like you and people who feel good about you. So, Focus on the relationship and the sale will take care of itself. If you aim at the sale or you think too much about the sale, what will happen is you will have neither the relationship nor the sale. So how do you build a high quality relationship with other people? Well, here's the rule. The rule is that listening builds trust. Customers want a relationship before anything else and listening builds trust. So how do you get a chance to listen? The key to making sales is to ask 
questions. And the very best salespeople are simply those who ask really good questions. Now, the second part of listening is to pause before replying. Is when the, cust- when the person stops talking, pause. Allow silence in the room. You see, we say that selling takes place with the words, but buying takes place in the silence. If the customer does not have enough time to process, then what happens is they don't have enough time to buy. So when they finish speaking, pause and let them think, and maybe they'll want to continue, or maybe they're finished talking. But when you pause, you tell the person that what you said is very important, and I'm thinking about it before I respond. If a person says one, two, three, and you say four, five, six, A, B, C, D, yeah. If you respond immediately after a person has finished speaking, what are you actually saying? Is I don't care about anything you said. I was just waiting for a chance for me to speak. But when you pause, you tell the person that you really care about what they're saying. Step number three in listening is to feed it back in your own words, or I'm sorry, is to question for clarification. Never assume that you know what the customer really means. The most powerful words in sales in every language are the words, how do you mean? Or how do you mean exactly? I'm doing this, or I'm doing that, or I want this, or I want that. Well, how do you, how do you mean exactly? It costs too much, or I can't afford it. How do you mean? Whenever you ask the question, how do you mean, the customer will expand and give you more information. And then you can say, well, how do you mean exactly? Every time you ask the question, the customer will tell you more information. They'll express themselves. They'll give you more information that you need to make a sale. And each time you ask a question, you get a chance to listen. And listening builds trust. The fourth key is to feed it back in your own words. Is don't just jump in with an answer. Say, well, let me be sure I understand what you're saying. This is what you're doing now, and this is what you're trying to do in the future, and this is your concern or your question. Is that right? And they'll say, yes, and this is proof that you were really listening. And people are immensely flattered when you can feed it back in your own words. So those are the four keys. Listen intently, pause before replying, question for clarification, and then feed it back in your own words before you speak. So I'll give you a technique, by the way. This will double your income. This technique is so powerful. It's been found that the top 10% of salespeople in 32 industries use this technique. And you teach this technique to people, and they won't use it. But in every audience, I say, does anybody use this technique? And there's always be somebody. I'll say, how does it work? And they'll say, it's, I mean, it's, it's like the, their seat was electri- electrified. They go, ah, customers love it. I mean, they just... And it's a very simple technique. It's called the agenda close. The agenda close is where you close the person on an agenda. So, for example, what you would do is you would say, Mr. Prospect, I know how busy you are, so I've prepared an agenda for our meeting. That now positions you as a professional. It positions you as a consultant. An agenda. You see, only professionals use agendas. Non-professionals go in and just talk. So what you do is I've prepared an agenda for our meeting, and you take a piece of your stationery, this is Nordic Business Forum, and you write agenda for meeting with the person's name, correctly spelled, very important, and the time and date. And then you have five or seven questions. Odd numbers are better than even numbers. Seven is one of the most powerful cosmic numbers. So I always think in terms of sevens. So you have seven questions. And so I've prepared an agenda for our meeting, and you space the questions over the page so a person can take notes. You write it in large print so a person does not have to get a magnifying glass to read it. And then there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Well, customers are astonished. They take it like this, and it's got their name and their uh, time and their business on it. And they sit, and then you have a copy yourself. You say, if we can just go through these questions, then you will know and I will know if this is a good idea for you or it's not. And at the end of the series of questions, you say, well, it looks like what we're offering and what you need seem to fit together pretty well. Uh, can, I, can I show you some of the details? And then you shift gears and you shift into the presentation. Now, just like identifying needs accurately is the 
turning point or the hinge on the gate or the door. The presentation is where the sale is made. You make the presentation by presenting your product or service in a special way. And this is worth a million dollars to you over the course of your career. This one piece of advice is people don't care what your product is. They don't care about you. They don't care about your company. They don't care about the background of your company. And they don't even care what the product is. People don't care. The only thing they care about is what this product or service does for me. You know, if you have a little child, the child says, me, me, mine, mine, me, me. All customers care. They're just children with better excuses. All they think about is me, me, me. What do I get? What's in it for me? And what they want is they want a change in their life. They want an improvement in their life, a result, a benefit, or highest of all is a transformation. They want to be transformed. There is an ABC theory of motivation that applies to selling. And A in English stands for antecedents or what happens in the past. B stands for behavior and C stands for consequences. What happens as a result of buying. Here's the rule. 15% of buying behavior is determined by the past. 85% of buying behavior is determined by the anticipated future. What is going to happen as a result of me buying? So, as we say, if you are selling a tour to the Canary Islands, spend 90% of your time talking about the destination and only 10% talking about the plane that you fly to the Canary Islands in. Most salespeople spend 90% of their time talking about the plane and only 10% of the time talking about the destination. Imagine if you went to a travel agent and you said, I want to take a vacation to the Canary Islands. And they said, well, let me show you how this plane works. And they take out a diagram of the airplane you're going to fly on and, and how you walk up the rampway and where you sit and the food they serve and the movie. You think, I don't want to hear about this. I just want to know about the islands and the palm trees and the ocean and the warm water and, and so on. So talk 90% about the change that will take place in the customer's life. Now, going back 6,000 years to ancient, uh, uh, ancient Sumeria, when they first began the first open markets, customers have only bought one thing in 6,000 years. Can you guess what it is? Well, the answer is improvement. Customers only buy improvement. The reason they buy is that they feel that the quality and quantity of the improvement will be greater than the cost and the trouble of using it or learning how to use it. When you answer objections, write down and say, what are the objections that I normally get? What we find is that no matter what you sell, there's never more than six objections. And we call this the law of six. And sometimes there will be several price objections, several uh, utilization or quality objections, or several uh, aesthetic or color objections. But your objections will categorize into roughly six groups. And then what you do is you just develop a powerful answer for each objection. I've known salespeople who've gone from knocking on doors to earning more than a million dollars a year because they became brilliant at answering objections. The top salesman in the world for many years was a man named Ben Feldman, Guinness Book of Records. And he answered objections so beautifully that he would give courses and people would sit on the floor like children around a campfire. And he would say that when the prospect says this, here's the answer. People went out and made millions of dollars in sales because they learned how to answer objections the way Ben Feldman did. So think of every objection you get and say, what's the very best answer for this objection? And so when the customer brings it up, you say, oh, that is a good question. And you answer it with your pre-prepared answer, and the objection just disappears, like cigarette smoke. If you're getting objections, it's, we say there's nothing wrong with losing a sale because you could not answer an objection. But it is unforgivable to lose a sale twice because you still have not found an answer. If you don't know how to answer a particular objection, whether it's price or quality or something else, ask other people. What do you say when the customer says this? In your office, 
Someone has come up with the right answer. Call the top salesperson in your industry, even in another company, and say, what do you say when the customer says this? And if there's an answer, they'll say, this is what we say. But you must find out the answers. Part number six is closing the sale. And closing the sale is uh, simply, uh, I'll give you the simplest of all closing techniques. It increases people's sales by five or ten times, and it's called the invitational close. The invitational close says that you, when a, you have made your presentation, you ask the customer this question, how do you like this so far? If the customer says, well, it looks quite good, you say then, why don't you give it a try? Why don't you give it a try? When you ask a customer the invitational close, the most powerful closing technique ever discovered, why don't you give it a try? The customer can only say, well, sure, I'll give it a try. Or they can say, well, no. In which case, you ask, why not? Why not? Now, a second closing technique is called the reverse close. And when a prospect says, uh, uh, would, would you, why don't you give it a try? And the prospect gives you an answer. You say, if we could take care of that to you, for you, to your complete satisfaction, would you give it a try? So you say, if we could, would you? If we could satisfy you on that, would you take it? The prospect says, yes, if you could satisfy me, say, then what would it take to satisfy you on that point? The most important word in life is for success, the most important word in sales is the word ask. Ask politely, ask confidently, ask warmly, ask charmingly, but ask for what you want. Ask the customer to take it today. Ask the customer, invite them to buy. Ask them why they're hesitating. But don't be afraid to ask. Remember, before you ask, the answer is probably no. If after you ask, the answer is still no, you've lost 10 seconds out of your life. So don't be afraid to ask. And the more you ask, ask politely, ask confidently, ask courteously. The more you ask, the more confident you'll become, and the more sales you'll make. The last point has to do with getting resales and referrals. And resales and referrals are really the key to your future. And the way that you get resales and referrals is you ask for resales and referrals. Do you know anyone else who might be interested in this product or service? And always ask your happy customers if they'll give you the names of additional people. As I say, the most important key to success in selling is to ask. So let me wrap up with just saying this. They, IBM did a study when they got into trouble in the 90s, and they paid $3 million for a major accounting firm to come in, or major consulting firm to come in and study their company nationwide. And the accounting firm came back and said, we have found the reason for your problem. And they said, well, what is it? They said, low sales. <laughs> they said, yes, we know that. What's the solution? They said, high sales. <laughs> and they said, well, thank you very much, but this, this company, it's called McKinsey & Company, but one of the best management consulting companies in the world, they always have an answer, and the answer always works. They said the answer is to get more of your people out into the field face-to-face -face with your customers. So IBM had 400,000 staff. They took 100,000 engineers. They put them through a crash course in selling, and they put them out on the street calling on those 80% of customers that nobody had ever called on. And IBM in one year turned around like a great ship in the ocean and became one of the most successful businesses in the world. So the last piece of advice I can give you is to get out there, spend more time face-to-face -face with more customers, and don't be afraid of the word no. Thank you very much.